Good morning. I call to order meeting number 261 of the Massachusetts Gaming Commission on February 14th, 2019 in our offices at 101 Federal Street here in Boston. Before I turn to our agenda, I wish to introduce myself. I'm Kathy Judd Stein, recently appointed chair to the commission. I wish to thank Commissioner Gail Cameron for her immediate past service as our interim chair. And I wish to thank all my fellow commissioners, uh, Executive Director Bedrosian, and the entire team here at the Gaming Commission for your warm welcome. First on the agenda is the approval of the minutes. Commissioner Stebbins. Sure. Thank you, Madam Chair, and welcome aboard. Uh, in your packet, you have the meeting minutes from the Janu January 24th uh, meeting of the Commission. Uh, I would move their approval, except for any um, material changes or grammatical corrections. I would like to add under the uh, 1008 uh, 2017 Suffolk Downs unpaid winnings that we mentioned that uh, senior finance analyst Chad Bork was on hand to uh, assist Dr. Lightbound in reporting the uh, financial numbers to the commission. But other than that, I feel it's the minutes are ready for our approval. Second. <clears throat> Any further discussion? So there's a motion with the amendment. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? I'll be abstaining, so 4-1, uh, Chair abstains. As to February 1st, Commissioner Stebbins? Sure, Madam Chair, in the packet you have the uh, meeting minutes from the very brief public session that was conducted on February 1st, 2019. I'd move the minutes be approved, again, subject to any immaterial changes or grammatical corrections. We have a second. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Again, I'll be abstaining. So the vote is 4 1 with the chair abstaining. Next on the agenda, item three, Executive Director Bedrosian, do you have an administrative update? I do. Good morning uh, and welcome, uh, Chair, new chair. Um, and of course, happy Valentine's Day to the Commission. Um, I'll have two updates. One is a uh, update on staff. I want to introduce a couple new staff members. Uh, we have new uh, financial investigators who are here with us today. Uh, David McKay. Uh, Dave comes to us from a public accounting fir firm where he was a, a senior assurance associate. Um, and he graduated with a BS from Bryant University, an MS in accounting and taxation from University of Hartford and was the college roommate of one of our previous financial investigators. And I'll, I'll leave that as just sort of a tease for you to figure out later on. We'll, we'll figure that out by the end of the day. Yeah. I, I, um, uh, so uh, in uh, Fei Zhu, um, I, I'm probably mispronouncing your last name, Fei, and I apologize for that, um, comes to us. And she's worked in diverse uh, backgrounds in the field of finance and accounting. She was with both State Street Bank in Santander and worked as a fund administrator, financial analyst, and regulatory reporting compliance. Uh, and she has a, a degree for, in both uh, finance and MBA from Bentley University. And they've actually, they're not new, new. They've been here for a little while, but they've been, um, they went out to uh, UNLV to get some training. Um, so they missed a meeting, so we're a little late in introducing them, but we want to welcome them and know they'll do a great job. Right. Welcome aboard. Welcome. Welcome. Welcome, and I see you already um, got on board. You were up at the Valentine's Day brunch earlier, so you're assimilating. Good work. Uh, the, the second part of my administrative update is just to give you uh, an update on a couple agenda items uh, for today. Um, item number six, the, the um, licensing division, I'm going to ask that that matter actually be um, pushed off to the next meeting, which we at this point anticipate will be uh, February 28th, and that um, reason is it might work with a uh, uh, MGM quarterly update. We can address everything in total. Um, so uh, the last uh, update I have for you is you'll notice, again, uh, item number 10, there's an executive session listed on the agenda. Uh, and as an update, since our last public meeting, as anticipated, the judge in Las Vegas has issued uh, the preliminary injunction which prohibits the IEB from using certain materials in its report until the matter can be more fully litigated. 
Um, I note that the preliminary injunction can be found on the Clark County website. Um, the IEB at this point is reviewing the preliminary injunction and its impact on the report. Our outside counsel are reviewing our legal options, including some complex uh, jurisdictional issues. These are issues I anticipate you'll hear about in today's executive session. Uh, we've listed a vote after the executive session in the event there's any commissioned action that needs to be taken because of your discussions, but there's no, no necessity or assurance on that. So those are the updates on the agenda, and that is the, my uh, administrative update. Uh, and the, the, um, whether we have a vote or not after the executive session, uh, we'll figure that out during the executive session, or is it fair to say that we will not? Uh, I think that's something you'd want to reserve the right to, to discuss during the executive okay. session. So in that, you'd, you'd, you'd probably report that you will come back after the executive session, yep. and you may come back just to say, we came back, and Fair that's enough. it. So uh, anything else? Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Item 4 on the Svenzienda, please. Good morning, commissioners. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, today, I provide a brief status of the 2019 Community Mitigation Fund applications. I'm joined here by Joe Delaney, Construction Project Oversight Manager, and fairly soon, Mary Thurlow. Uh, my purpose here today is to just give you a brief overview of the process that we plan to take to review these applications. I'm not planning to get into any detail regarding uh, any one of the applications. Uh, indeed, the review team has not even met yet. Uh, so, but I just wanted to remind the commissioners and remind those in the audience of the, of the process of uh, how we're going to take a look at these applications. Uh, before I begin, I just wanted to note that in your packet, um, there is a memo that describes all of the applications that we received. Since that memo uh, was written, we have determined that there is one additional application uh, that was submitted. We're checking to make sure that it was uh, timely submitted. We, we have every belief that it was timely submitted from the city of Springfield um, regarding the focus, uh, the previous focus application, uh, MGM Springfield's um, location in the facility, uh, the focus cable access provider right out, uh, at the corner of State and Main. Um, so that application, which uh, we, we understand was submitted was for approximately $555,000. It is not reflected in the memo before you. We will try to get that updated before the end of the meeting and we'll post the correct memo. We apologize for that error. So in total, uh, with the new focus application, the commission received 24 applications worth approximately $5.6 million. Of that $5.6 million, 200,000 was previously awarded to the Southeastern Regional Planning and Development District, so only $4.9 million, excuse me, the, uh, so only uh, $5.4 million represents new funding. Our targeted spending for this year is approximately $6.7 million. Uh, we have approximately $5.2 million left in the fund that has not been awarded or otherwise allocated. This is the first year that the mitigation fund has begun to receive 6.5% of the revenues from the tax on gross gaming revenue from the Region B Category 1 licensee, MGM Springfield. Uh, over $1.5 million of revenue was placed into the mitigation fund from MGM Springfield by December 31st of last year. So, uh, so thereby, thus, uh, so there we have, uh, this is the first year that the commission plans to split uh, the fund by region uh, based on our, our guidelines, whereby the funds generated in each region are targeted to stay in that region after we account for all grants that we make for category two licensees. So let me just give you an example to make that a little bit more clear. So uh, if the commission awards a total of approximately $200,000 in grants relative to the category two licensee, we had, would have approximately $5 million left out of the original funds to be split between the Region A and Region B regions. So we would have $2.5 million for the West, $2.5 million for the East. However, as I just stated, that we have approximately $1.5 million uh, from MGM Springfield revenues. So uh, based on the allocation that we made uh, in the guidelines, there would be 
$4 million available in the Western Region and the Region B Region, and $2.5 million for the Region A Region uh, for this year. So as you'll see in the packet, we have a memo that summarizes the funding amounts and gives you a little detail regarding the applications we received. Um, it matches up the applications we received versus the spending targets that we established in those guidelines. So um, I just want to work a little bit backwards from when we plan to issue these awards. We're hoping to have determinations made well, by, uh, well before the beginning of the new fiscal year. So we aim to do our awards by uh, June. Uh, of this year, similar to what we did last year. However, there is a potential that we may come to the Commission with some recommendations before that June date. Last year, we came to you with some public safety recommendations and some workforce uh, recommendations before that June date because of the need to move forward with applications earlier to prepare for upcoming potential impacts. Um, so the review team that we have is comprised of myself, uh, Commissioner Stebbins is joining us this year, Catherine Blue, Derek Lennon, Jill Griffin, Joe Delaney, Crystal Howard, and Mary Thurlow, and we also have the assistance of the IEB for public safety related items. So for the next steps, we will reach out to our licensees. As the Commission knows, we, we ask the licensees their opinion on the applications. We post these online. We ask the regional planning agencies their opinions. And then we uh, will also get a memo from the Massachusetts Department of Transportation regarding transportation items. And then we will meet with all of the applicants uh, in short form uh, to go over any concerns we have with their applications and to give them the opportunity to answer any questions. Um, before we have that meeting, we welcome any questions uh, from the commissioners that we could raise to those applicants. And after that, we will come back to the commission for uh, a recommendation like I said, hopefully uh, no later than the beginning of June. Uh, yeah, um, thank you. Uh, uh, John, uh, remind me, um, in the past we talked about, uh, now that we're going, we're thinking uh, uh, and considering this um, split of the regions, uh, we talked about instances in which uh, maybe monies begin to build in one region relative to the other or are committed and not, not used. Do you want to um, talk a little bit about what we're anticipating in So that what, regard, we, what we determine, if there are unused funds from any one year, we would keep those funds in the region for up to three years. And then after that third year, then they could flow back into the general fund and be available for all regions. Right. right. So we're planning on, on starting that yeah. with this year. That's right. That practice. And again, uh, these are guidelines that we review every year. So if there are circumstances that uh, become difficult, we can review them again next year. But right. that's the plan. We work that out after uh, a lot of comments from our from our regional partners and from our local partners on how they would like to see that split. Right. Now, uh, so we um, we have just a general uh, number of four million for um, Region B. It's the two and a half and the one point five that's right. projected right. to flow. Uh, for the for the current fiscal year, that's right. Um, how many? What's the number that came um, from that region relative to that four million? Okay, so we have. Um, I didn't quite total them. In yeah, the memo. no, no, no. It's right at the bottom of the memo. So we have from Region A, we had uh, approximately three point one eight seven million in funding requests. Okay. And then in Region B, we had uh, approximately two point two million. Okay. With the addition of the uh, five hundred fifty-five thousand dollar that you just talked about for Springfield. Purpose. Okay. All right. <clears throat> but these, of course, are preliminary numbers. They'll they'll get reviewed by the review team and That's right. um, uh, like the the way you've done in the past, and we'll get with a much better um, sense of those numbers as the process continues. That's right. On Buds and CM, but I had a similar related question. Knowing that the numbers are larger this year with the opening of a Category 1 um, casino, um, the review team will be utilizing similar criteria, though, meaning the nexus has to be there for an That's impact right. from the casino. That's right. No matter what the dollars are, right. they really still have to meet those, uh, our guidelines, correct? Uh, 
we really believe that we have to be responsible stewards of these dollars mm -hmm. and the statutory purpose for these dollars is to make sure that we offset costs related to the construction or operation of gaming facilities. Mm -hmm. We get a lot of very worthwhile projects every single year, but the difficult job is for us to make sure that it is really directly connected mm -hmm. to, the, to the casino. So even though we have a number of applications, generally uh, the recommendation from the review team is that we would fund uh, that we recommend funding less than those applications. For example, last year we had approximately um, approximately eight million dollars worth of applications, and the review team recommended about five. Mm -hmm. So those same guidelines will be implemented, even though the dollars are larger. That's exactly right. Okay, thank you. And, and one thing that I think um, perhaps goes without saying, but it's important for um, just for the record. Um, my estimation here is that there's substantial requests now coming from host communities. In specifically, I'm thinking of Springfield. And um, the statute also anticipated, and um, there's a lot of um, monies that come to the city from, uh, from the casino as part of the host community agreement. Um, so as, we, as, as the review team reviews those uh, requests, an important thing to consider is whether anything has already been anticipated as part of the host community mm -hmm. um, and is either not addressed or addressed partially or addressed totally and uh, in order for us to make uh, the funding uh, approval accordingly. That's exactly right. That's one of the other tough questions that we um, ask during these sessions of what are the anticipated purposes of these funds, the host community funds and the surrounding community funds every year and we, we include all of that information uh, in the packet that we provide to the Commission at the end of the year but indeed in past years we have uh, rejected applications because it was covered by a host community uh, provision. Mm -hmm. I, I think there's, a, there's another, we're getting to this phase where we're also going to be able to rely on a lot of the research that's being done that you know, Mark and his team are doing around community impacts as well so we have our own base of information make some of these um, decisions as well. Um, John, just real quick, we do face a statutory deadline for communities to apply. That's kind of hard and fast. Did you anticipate some applications that didn't come in because people, communities not able to hit that February 1st deadline or is it becoming kind of process now that they know when it's going to be in? Well, the big omission was the Springfield application where we were very surprised that uh, I didn't seem to have that application. Right. And the background behind that is there was an application that was made this past year for that, and then the city withdrew that application because there's very t little time left before this current deadline and this current program. So we anticipated that they're going to withdraw last year's application, submit this year's application, um, and indeed it looks like that they did. But in a larger sense, uh, I think you're right. Um, we have only six months, we're only six months into the operations of MGM Springfield, and it takes quite a bit of time before communities can really understand the true impacts. So um, we'll, we'll see. We'll see over time what other additional applications we will get, and I imagine um, our, all of our review teams and our local committees will explore with a range of impacts that we would need to build into future year programs. Okay. But everybody is. Familiarity with that February 1st statutory deadline, that, yeah. you know, that's when it's got to be in, and it's kind of accepted business practice at this point. We, we send out numerous reminders, and it's on the combine system. You know, sometimes that gets a little glitchy, um, and we're working to improve all of that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next on the agenda, um, item five, Director Griffin, you'll be reporting on workforce supplier and diversity development.
Good morning, Director. Happy Valentine's Day. Good morning. <laughs> Thank you very much. Happy Valentine's Day to you. Um, so, uh, Jill Griffin. Mm -hmm. um, I think we're supposed to still do that for the. Um, <laughs> <laughs> So um, today I'm here to give you an update on some of the major projects that the Workforce Supplier and Diversity Development um, Department is, or team is working on. Um, and the first I'd like to update you on is a uh, request for responses, an RFR that we um, posted on February 1st um, called Built to Last, which will be a summary of the best practices for diversity in construction and the lessons learned. Um, and we really seek to capture both lessons learned and the best practices regarding the construction of all three of our licensees um, projects. Um, we envision the end product to be a lasting legacy um, based on interviews of project stakeholders, um, many of whom are um, um, regular members of the Access and Opportunity Committee meeting and, and um, have invested significant time in monitoring the projects, in, um, including our licensees, their general contractors, subcontractors, uh, uh, union leaders, and community members. Um, the um, bid is um, posted in combis, like I mentioned. Responses are due by 4 p.m. on March 1st and must be submitted directly into combis. Um, it, um, the um, post was um, sent to about 900 um, individuals and businesses, and we have received um, a lot of interest uh, in terms, in the form of questions, uh, but um, we look forward to reading um, full proposals. Uh, any questions? Mm -hmm. um, Jill, I was looking at the, at the packet, and uh, I, I noticed there's, um, in what must have been posted as part of this um, solicitation, um, that the contract was to be fully executed by June 30th of 2019. But that doesn't mean that has to be, the performance of the contract has to be done by then, correct? That's right. Um, we intend to um, um, spend the money from the, the budget from this year, but um, certainly the work could be extended. Um, and we realized that was kind of an ambitious um, timeline. We actually extended the um, timeline so that we could get the, um, you know, a large number of really um, great responses. So. Right, um, but I, al I also noticed that there is um, a, a four a four month duration, I guess, from the contract um, execution, or what is a four month duration? A four month duration. Um, so um, we hope to execute the contract in March. Yep. Um, and um, the selected um, bidder would have time to interview um, and gather information for, um, for the report. And we're expecting um, really to receive a draft um, first. And, um, and I think that maybe that's what you're talking about. Um, but those are just um, draft timelines. We plan to um, work with the selected bidder to establish a, you know, a firm and realistic timeline. Okay, because uh, I was going to suggest that you know you may want to have a renewal option or some kind of, um, you know, flexibility rel relative to the timeline, especially to make sure that you don't straddle uh, fiscal years yeah. and find yourself in a sort of constrained, artificial constraint, if you will. That's um, a really good the, suggestion. If the scope sort of slips a little bit. So include that in the contract. Mm -hmm. When you get to the contract. Good suggestion. Thank you. Jill, sure. just a, a great quite, uh, great project. Um, I even like the title, and I know you came up with that. Um, we're going to provide the list of folks to be interviewed, and a lot of those are folks that we've had regular contact with. but. 
when I look at the projects, some of the contractors, subcontractors that we may not have as much familiarity with, how do you hope to develop that list of folks? Um, well, I'd like to um, really pull from our licensees, uh, you know, um, especially the category ones. They both had um, um, award programs. They, they um, as well as the using the stick, they used the carrot, right? And so they recognized, um, you know, the top performers. And I would like to select from that, uh, from those lists, um, and and perhaps maybe even pull from the corrective action meetings and see what some of the challenges were there. Um, yeah, it's a great idea. Thank you, Director Griffin. You, you said you received a lot of interest, but obviously, this is a new um, project, mm -hmm. so. Uh, that must mean are they emailing, calling, and so are you providing technical assistance since it is new to kind of give them assistance on how to uh, be best prepared to compete? So um, everything is going through combines, right. but we've received, um, I want to say, more than 20 questions okay. that we will also post today, actually this morning as we speak, it's likely being posted to combines. So, um, each of the interested parties is asking questions about, um, you know, further defining what the work product would look like mm -hmm. and how many interviews and um, do the interviews need to take place in person or remotely, those types of clarifying mm -hmm. questions. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Yeah. Great. Thanks. Um, I noticed that typo in the, in the solicitation. Um, okay. It's in, in um, page number four. Uh, I think it says um, the budget is fifteen thousand dollars, I believe. What paragraph? But there's the fiscal terms. Okay. There's a there's a fourth zero. I hope it doesn't get confused with one hundred and fifty thousand dollars. <laughs> I think the comma is in the right place. So um, we will certainly um, talk to our, our finance team about clarifying yeah. that um, in combines. Great. But in fact, the budget is fifteen thousand dollars. Yes, so fifteen thousand. <coughs> right. That's correct. Let's uh, correct the record. <laughs> um. Well, I think this is a great, uh, great effort. I, I hope that um, many other organizations will benefit from this. We'll first have to, you know, have it done and then uh, see what the response is. But uh, given my familiarity with. Um, the AOC and all the efforts that you helped us help us uh, uh, lead very uh, well. Uh, this would be a very good, um, very good effort. Thank you. We've had a lot of interest and inquiries about um, the work of the Access and Opportunity Committee and and kind of um, asking for advice. Um, um, and um, in talking with Commissioner Stebbins, we decided that not only um, to put together a report, but we're like we're in the beginning process of organizing an event um, out in Western Mass um, to really highlight some of this work as well. Mm -hmm. So um, that will likely happen in the springtime. So, so thank you. Um, so this is um, really fun, but some of my role, um, much of my role focuses on compliance. And um, as um, required by uh, Chapter 23K, Section 12, and License Condition 11, each licensee is required to submit an affirmative marketing program to enable minority women and veteran-owned um, vendors to participate in the provision of goods and services um, to each construction project as well as a plan to identify local businesses. Um, commissioners, at the October 26th meeting, you approved um, Encore Boston Harbor's diversity and local business plan, um, provided that the licensee provide additional information. Um, you asked for an overview of the gift card program, um, 
more information about um, how they plan to mentor uh, some of the local businesses and um, um, if they planned to, um, could they provide information about um, uh, feedback that they would give to firms, um, minority women and veteran owned firms specifically who were not awarded the license. Um, and um, the procurement director um, has submitted um, the final plan with these changes and um, um, the legal team has determined that no additional approvals are necessary as the changes are non-material. So the final copy has been posted on the website, but I just wanted to close the loop there. I know I updated many of you one-on-one, -on -one, so. Um, additionally, to follow up on this um, plan, um, on uh, January 29th, I convened what we call our vendor advisory team. Um, in this room, we had um, 25 to 30 um, chambers of commerce, state um, entities that focus on business, um, uh, community groups, um, city officials, um, to, to get more information on procurement needs and, and um, opportunities. Um, and we plan to convene this um, monthly. Um, also in the, um, in the packet is a flyer from Encore Boston Harbor regarding um, hiring. Um, and and there, there we go. Um, one, of, one of their first uh, hiring, or the, one of the first big hiring fairs is taking place on February 24th to 25th um, at the Heinz Convention Center. Um, and as we did with MGM, um, we um, um, update the commission and the public on the goings on. Um, they're providing exclusive access to the host and surrounding community residents from 7 to 9 a.m. on those days. Um, and if you could flip to the next page, um, they're specifically um, focusing on um, those particular positions um, and very broadly in many different categories um, across uh, the organization. So, from food and beverage to gaming. Um, when is this hiring event again? Um, February 24th and 25th. So it's, a, uh, I believe it's a Sunday, Monday. Um, uh, so, yeah. Will you, will you be attending? Uh, have you attended prior, prior events like this? Yes. Yeah. Um, this will be the, I think, the largest, but I do plan to be there. Um, and this, uh, this notice did go out broadly to community center, uh, not community centers, I'm sorry, career centers and community groups um, that are um, meeting regularly with um, the licensee. Mm -hmm. so, um, Director Griffin, before we go on to the next um, matter, I just want to thank you for the work that you've done that's very innovative in the best practices arena. I suspect that that will benefit this commission and our mission, but also the Commonwealth widely, so thank you. Oh, thank you, thank you. Uh, um, if I could just uh, point one thing out that I thought was interesting <clears throat> in, there's an op-ed today in the Globe I saw by that. Mayor Walsh and Brian Golden, the head of, and I apologize, it was the BRA. I know it has a new B title. BBA. Um, but it does talk about Boston, um, I shouldn't say following. Um, they don't necessarily mention the casino construction diversity, but they talk about the same model, and they point uh, next door to where the construction next door <laughs> that's being done by the same general contractor. Mm -hmm. So certainly I, we hope, we hope, um, the lessons that that contractor learned working with us in Everett has 
uh, made its way into the city. So I thought that was a great, uh, indirectly, not directly, but at least indirectly, um, a great nod to the advances that Director Griffin and her folks have really uh, helped in the casino construction industry. So we'll we'll get that out to all of you and get that that clip out to all of you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, um, Director. Uh, Jill, just one quick question. Uh, I notice a number of the jobs they're interviewing for require will require some licensing. Um, do you plan to have our your colleagues in licensing uh, attending or participating or at least providing information? Well, Bill Curtis and I are attending together, um, but there is um, there. Um, they have um, had uh, the licensing presence um, at the Career Center along with um, fingerprinting and all of that. So um, the integration is taking place. Great. Thank you. Um, Director Griffin, I, I, I see their um, posting here, which is very well done. Um, it says, please uh, apply online prior to arrival. I know that was challenging for some of the folks in Springfield, mm -hmm. applying online. Is, um, is there thought given to um, assisting those who may not have uh, easy access to, to a computer? Yeah, I think um, applying online is encouraged but not required. I see. Um, and I know that many of our um, the entities funded through the community mitigation funds um, are assisting in those efforts. So at some of those locations, they'd be able to apply online. Right, right. Good. And help them maybe print a resume, prepare a resume. Right. And we've funded also um, um, workforce readiness um, right. efforts that mm -hmm. assist in those efforts as well. Mm -hmm. so. Great. Thank you. Well done. Um, so. Um, I wanted to also update you on our efforts to improve licensee oversight functions. Um, we're in the process of um, performing a diversity audit. Um, we've developed a process to perform periodic evaluations of our licensees compliance with their established diversity goals. Um, and as we did with our other licensee, MGM Springfield, we're performing an audit on the diversity information that they submit monthly to our Access and Opportunity Committee meeting. Um, so we met um, recently um, with Suffolk Construction and Encore Boston Harbor's construction diversity team. And um, the intent of this visit was to develop a real comprehensive understanding of the processes and systems in place um, for the uh, uh, compiling of data that they report each month to us. Um, so construction oversight manager Do Joe Delaney, program coordinator Crystal Howard and I are in the process of reviewing this documentation relevant to both um, workforce diversity and supplier and vendor diversity. Um, we're conducting spot checks on supporting documentation of several subcontractors that we chose um, um, looking at the March meeting, including we're looking at uh, weekly certified payroll reports, subcontractor certification documents, email correspondence, and corrective action logs. Um, and we really, um, the intent is to verify um, the processing and reporting of the diversity data um, and to evaluate the adequacy of the management controls. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we are um, in the process of the reviewing of um, stacks of information, um, but we plan on submitting a summary memo to the Commission's Compliance Committee at the end of March. Mm -hmm. Now, Jill, remind us, um, the, um, we did a, um, a similar effort for MGM. That's right. Um, and at the time that we did that effort, there, it was a two-tier, just like you described. First, ascertaining the, how they capture information, how they get uh, some of the reports themselves and how they then report to us. Yes. And then sub 
followed by the, you know, by the audit, if you will, the, the spot check that you described. Yes. My understanding was that we had already ascertained the system, in other words, the tier one of Anchor as well at that time. Yes. Is that the case? That was the case. Um, we had some time ago um, uh, met with Encore and um, their GC. Um, we had a little refresher um, because that was some time ago. But okay. um, and then last, um, maybe it was Monday. No, Tuesday actually. We received um, the documentation um, that we intend to review for the actual um, audit. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, well, this, I, we look forward to the, the end result um, at first at the compliance uh, group, uh, but um, I'll, uh, I'll just mention uh, for the record for you, for your benefit, uh, Madam Chair, that um, uh, based, uh, this, this process was really thought through based on uh, feedback from the state auditor when they first did the, uh, the audit um, going on uh, almost two years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I think it's it's really solid, uh, and I'm glad that we're seeing it to fruition. Yes, and and um, we are encouraged by what we see so far, but we look forward to digging into the information. So thank Great. you. Um, and last but certainly not least, we have um, some regulations, um, and I think I'm going to uh, provide a. a brief um, intro and then turn it over to our Deputy General Counsel. Um, so currently um, we have some div diversity definitions um, that talk about what is a minority owned business, an MBE, um, a VBE, or a WBE. Um, and we um, allow certain certifications in those regulations. Um, however, those regulations pertain right now specifically to construction. Um, so what we're intending to do is um, uh, apply um, and create regulations that apply to the operations period as well. We're not making um, um, substantive changes to the definitions, um, but this is the introductory um, period. So I'll turn it over to Ted Grossman. Thank you, Jill, and good morning, commissioners. Good morning. Um, as Jill uh, described, the proposal before you would simply add definitions uh, to for MBE, VBE, and uh, WBE uh, that would be a broad application, so they would apply to the ongoing uh, reporting obligations of the casinos as opposed to just the construction uh, obligations there essentially the same exact definitions that apply in the construction section of the regulations. You'll see some highlighting in uh, the draft before you. Those uh, reflect some updates since the initial version that you may have seen in the packet. They're largely um, administrative. Um, as you can see, there's some capitalization and, and things of that nature. Ultimately, as it pertains to the uh, VBE definition, uh, the point here was to take ourselves more out of the certification process and defer to the OSD uh, process, uh, just to pick up on part of the conversation from before. When we first uh, started doing this, there was no process, essentially, for the certification of veteran business enterprises, so we had to create our own. Now OSD actually has one, so we're migrating over to their way. Uh, of doing it. So that's what this definition reflects in part uh, as well. So this is the first time you've seen this. We would ask you um, just to have a look, obviously uh, offer any uh, comments. We will come back before you at an upcoming meeting and ask that we start moving it uh, through the process. We'll circulate this to the licensees and other uh, stakeholders uh, to see if they have any comments before we uh, engage in the formal Um, Todd or, or, uh, or, or Jill, I, um, we don't anticipate that uh, this um, definition clarification would in any way change the numbers um, that have either already been reported to us by licensees or will continue to be reported 
This really just adds clarification to the certification part? It does. Um, I, I don't envision any changes. Um, you know, I, I think um, we've been having discussions with licensees regarding um, this, so I, I don't anticipate um, any huge issues. It may encourage businesses to get certified by our state supplier diversity office or by other um, entities, um, but I don't envision any um, impact in terms of the numbers. Great. Didn't our licensees find that they had more, uh, in particular, veterans, but they did not uh, really understand uh, a way to register, so this may improve numbers, correct? Um, the um, veteran issue, some, some um, veterans don't wish to call attention to their veteran oh, status, um, but hmm. we are, others are just unaware, so this, you're right, there are some who may, um, in hearing this, they may um, decide to get certified. I see. And, um, was there any resolution? I remember last year we dealt with the change with the um, Portuguese population. Is that still? Um, um, yeah. Portu Portuguese-owned businesses are not considered right. minority-owned businesses. Right. There was Anymore. some resolution. Yeah. yeah. That was a change a little while ago. And right. Um, so, so our licensees. Um, are not reporting PBEs as minority-owned businesses. Um, effective the date um, mm -hmm. that that was determined. Mm -hmm. so. And by the way, if I can circle back to my um, prior comment, if there is any way in which this changes anything, I would want it to be just prospectively. Mm -hmm. No need to kind of try to go back and true up anything that has been reported to us in the past. Um, so I, I think that would be a, you know, a useless effort. Okay. Just in case. I think the um, this refers to operations, and um, um, I don't anticipate Plain Ridge Park Casino having any um, issues, and I think MGM is, um, you know, their um, procurement program is in its infancy, right? They just opened, so I don't mm -hmm. anticipate any. Um, issues. Right. Director, in terms of this notice today, this is the beginning of the rulemaking process, so we will right. invite public comment at this point in time. Yes. Right. And yeah, we would like to hear if there are any um, potential impacts. Mm -hmm. I, okay. But we usually, this, this is the initial draft, uh, the way we normally um, bring a regulation. Um, is to have this kind of discussion, brainstorming, and questions. Um, if there's any edits, we send it back to staff, mm -hmm. come back to the commission, and then that begins the, uh, the, the promulgation process. Okay. So we would not be, uh, if I understand this correctly, uh, we would not be putting anything to be in at this time to begin the promulgation process. That's right. That's okay. why it's not scheduled for a vote. Yes. Um, our custom has been to have you take a look at it first put it out, see what we get, incorporate the comments, and then come back to you with a formal vote to start the promulgation process. Okay. Mm -hmm. It will go out for comments again during that process, so if we yes. get any more comments, that's fine. And then we'll make final revisions before we come back to you for a final vote on the promulgation. Right. Thank you for that clarification, Commissioner. Thank you. General Counsel. Yeah, I, just to, to compliment Jill and Todd, because you've been working on this for a while, we all knew kind of the problem that was in front of us was no existing process, especially in the area of veteran certification. And I think you guys, in working with licensing, came up with a process that was a stopgap. Glad to see SDO came up with their own process, and we've certainly pushed people to that. We've uh, met with the folks at SDO to make sure the process was easy, convenient, and, and, uh, and expedient, and they can pretty much you provide all the paperwork, they can usually mm -hmm. turn around a certification in less than 30 days or about 30 days. So mm -hmm. um, it's a quick process. So um, I did have a question uh, under, in, and again, something for you to think about or a comment. Under the uh, Women in Business Enterprise, you talk about the SDO certification and the Women's Business 
Enterprise National Council. Mm -hmm. That's the uh, certification that our local friends at uh, the Center for Women and Enterprise give out. Mm -hmm. Should we add the CWE name or mention it just so it kind of clarifies for anybody who has the WeBank certification? They may think of it as, well, I got the CWE certification, but just kind of maybe clarify that by either adding their name or referencing that folks might have gone through the, that process as well, just so they're not, somebody reading this doesn't think, oh my gosh, I gotta run out and get another certification. We could certainly um, clarify that. Um, they are the local entity that provides the national certification, but uh, we could certainly clarify that. Okay, thank you. Oh, the so CWE is the local chapter mm -hmm. of the, okay. Of the WE Bank. Okay. Yeah. So just to okay. avoid any confusion over what I actually have is, is, is certification. Again, I haven't seen the document, so it may say the WeBank name on it, but yeah, it does. we um, also know CWE is a, is, a, is a big player in this mm -hmm. effort. That's a good suggestion. We can do that, Noted. right? Noted. <laughs> <laughs> Any further questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. As to item six, as Executive Director Brosian, Brosian mentioned that item was moved and will be uh, heard at the February 28th meeting. So next on our agenda is item seven, Research and Responsible Gaming. Director Vander Linden, thank you for your update. Great. Good morning. Good morning, Good morning. Um, Good morning. Chair Judd Stein and Commissioners. So um, I'm providing to you a, a periodic update on what's happening with the research agenda, both in terms of uh, deliverables that were recently released, um, projects or deliverables that are upcoming. Um, there's a few other um, activities that I think are certainly worth noting. Um, and at the back of the memo that I gave to you, it's just a, a list of, an extensive list of the, the um, different reports and publications that have been created as part of MGC's uh, research agenda. Um, so um, I think the last time I provided a report to you was um, around October. So I wanted to just kind of cover for you some of the, uh, the reports and provide a summary for reports that have been released since that time. Um, we have two reports, actually, that, that were just released um, that relate to trying to better understand um, at-risk and problem gambling among veterans. Um, the first is, uh, was actually just, just published on January 18th in the Journal of Gambling Studies, and it was led by Dr. Volberg and our Sigma team. Um, this study uh, utilized the uh, baseline general population survey that was fielded in Massachusetts back in 2013, 2014. Um, of that sample of 9,578 uh, participants, we identified um, 129 problem gamblers. Um, interestingly, of those 129 problem gamblers that were identified, 20% um, were identified as, as veterans. Um, in order to, to make this a, a larger, more robust sample size, um, that um, smaller sample of problem gambler, veteran problem gamblers was combined with veterans that were also identified as at risk so that we could take a, a, a look specifically at their gambling behavior and maybe um, conditions that surrounded that. that. The results were interesting. Um, the, the team identified that Having friends and family members that engaged in gambling, um, and as well as engaging in more than one gambling format, meaning they go to casinos, they play the lottery, they um, do sports betting, um, was highly uh, associated with being a problem or at-risk gambler. Um, interestingly, the, they found that participating in raffles in the past year was associated with lower odds of being a problem or at-risk gambler. Um, and when I spoke with them at greater detail about that, um, 
they, they said, you know, a lot of times raffles are, are primarily used as fundraisers and not necessarily considered as gambling by, by the veterans. So um, there, was, there was some explanation to try to back that um, finding up. Um, it's always good to understand what the implications for this, uh, for our research are. Um, and I think that's something I want to highlight for you in just a few minutes. But um, the implications for this, um, the, the team identified um, that this type of information, understanding that, um, that problem and at-risk gamblers are engaged in more than one format of gambling, understanding that they, they, they gamble socially or they gamble with friends and family around them, these are important pieces or nuggets of information to have as we think about constructing um, both intervention and prevention programs that are specifically targeted towards um, a veteran population. The second veteran study that um, was conducted was actually part of a, a larger um, push by the commission um, to examine um, gambling behaviors, attitudes uh, among groups that would be considered at risk. Um, we funded three of those studies, and the next two studies that I wanted to highlight for you actually came from that line, line of funding. Uh, the first was um, funding that we provided to the Bedford R VA Research Corporation. Um, they set out in their study to uh, um, evaluate the reliability and validity of the BBGS, or the Brief Biopsychosocial Screening, um, that they would use uh, for among all the VA patients coming into primary care behavioral health clinics in, in Bedford. They also wanted to try to better understand or evaluate the prevalence of problem gambling among veterans and its co-occurrence with other medical and mental health conditions. Um, so the, the, the results here, are, I think, are, are a bit mixed, but I, I think that there's a lot of directions that this study um, has gone and will continue to go. Um, of the veterans that gambled, 5.9% endorsed at least one item out of the three items that are on this BBGS or the Brief Biopsychosocial Screen. Um, of those that gambled, um, um, that would be of those individuals that had gambled in the last 12 months. Of the sample as a whole, it was 1.9%. So that would include ga uh, gamblers that hadn't gambled in, in the past 12 months. This was very much in line with actually some of the, the findings that we had in our um, general uh, population baseline study. Um, but the sample size and the number of veterans that endorsed even one BBGS item was so small that it would be difficult to make a conclusion about the overall prevalence rate of problem gambling or even at-risk gambling amongst uh, veterans. Um, so to that end, um, we perhaps the, missed the mark on what the overall objectives of that study were, but I think it's really what, what has happened since is, I think, incredibly encouraging. Um, without a doubt, veterans are, are considered at greater risk of developing gambling-related harm. Um, that came true to us in our own Massachusetts-based research, but it's also borne out in other studies that have happened around, around the country. And so it doesn't, we, we want to continue to try to, to focus on this, on this specific group and to better understand how we can, we can be of, of service. So Dr. Shane Krauss, who was a principal investigator on this, on this study, um, is using this, as a, this study as a launching pad to provide additional training to, uh, to the clinical staff at the Bedford VA Medical Center. Um, Dr. Shane Krauss has really launched a, a career in, into this area in this line of research and is, is quite brilliant. Um, and he's, he's used this study, he's also been involved in a national study of over a thousand um, veterans that was recently complete completed, and it's this, this study can continue to try to help and inform the much broader study, and still, even with, with some of its limitations, I think adds to, to that, that um, larger body of evidence that continues to grow. Um, so there's also um, Dr. Dr. Krauss and his co-investigator, um, Dr. Shirk, 
um, used this study as the basis um, for funding a funding request with the National Center for Responsible Gaming. I didn't include this in here only because I found this out just a couple days ago, um, which is great, right? What we want is is um, is we we have funding for research in this area, but what we really want is for this to be used more broadly. We want this to continue to, to grow, to be, fill in the gaps. If there isn't a, a group that we consider at, at greater risk, probably, most likely, and certainly with the case of veterans, um, we get part of the story. And um, the, the research that exists is probably, is probably OK, but there's certainly ways in which we can better understand um, what's happening and how it can be a better service. What types of intervention and what types of prevention programs um, can more um, appropriately respond to, to the needs. And so to that end, I feel like this, the combination of these two studies and, and this one with the Bedford VA in particular, um, I'm, I'm excited about and excited to see where, where this, how this study can contribute and how, how Dr. Krauss and Dr. Shirk will continue to do their work and, and research um, with the VA. Mark, remind me, I, I thought Dr. Krauss' approach um, included the DSM-5 Yes, so it, it, it did if, they, if the veterans at um, intake responded positively to uh, one, of, one or more of the three item BBGS, they went on to a full um, uh, assessment that included um, all of the criteria of uh, the DSM, the nine criteria. Okay, so it was a two tier. Yes. Okay. Mark, um, so the numbers are the same. 1.9 percent. So the numbers are very similar to general population, but you, the doctor, you, you feel like you didn't. Folks weren't self-identifying. Is that it? Is that is that what we're trying to find yeah. other ways to, to reach people? Is that you, you know, it's interesting that we found in the general population baseline survey, right. a non-VA based um, survey. Um, a higher rate compared to um, a survey that was administered under the umbrella of the VA. Um, this is simply my hypothesis. It may or may not be true, but that that perhaps um, when entering into the VA system, um, individuals may be less forthcoming um, about what the presenting problems are. Um, maybe that would come out later on as a therapeutic relationship develops with whatever clinician they're, they're working with. But perhaps there's some hesitancy to, be, to fully disclose at, at admission. You're more likely to, uh, if you're a veteran, to answer an anonymous survey and less likely if you're in the VA setting where you might feel that um, your employer might take some kind of action. I, I, I think there's also, uh, which was part of uh, the, 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 the limitations and assumptions in the study, if I remember correctly, yeah. from Dr. Krauss. Um, there's also, and I, don't, I really don't want to make too big of a deal on this, but there is diff different uh, measuring. This is the, the screening tool. Mm -hmm. um, Dr. Krauss used the, the BBGS, which is a brief tool, just three right. questions before going into a DSM, which is a therapeutic type of um, um, Q&A whereas our general population survey uses by necessity this, uh, the PPGM, or, or is it the CPGI? Yeah, uh, PPGM and CPGI. PP, yeah. Problem the, gambling, problem pathological gambling. The problem Canadian gambling. Uh, index. It's, it's, it's like 10 or 11 questions that get you to, um, to you know, whether you're at risk or not, mm -hmm. or a problem gambler. Um, they're, they're all really good tools and used in, in um, you know, we're using the best tools um, uh, available, um, but there could be at least, in addition to what you just mentioned, the notion that there is different tools being used to compare uh, similar numbers. Okay. W one other um, highlight that that I think is is evolving from this is some. Uh, we we had a very good meeting with Secretary Urena of the VA, mm -hmm. um, right. his chief of staff. Um, they're very interested in, um, in how we can partner, we're very interested in partnering, um, to be able to provide um, 
prevention services through GameSense to, um, to veterans in, in a variety of different settings, whether it's our, our GameSense um, advisors working directly within the, with, with veterans or whether it's us training um, the, the uh, staff or veteran advisors, um, we're, we're open to both. There was also an interest in, in making sure that we uh, make our voluntary self-exclusion program uh, widely available um, across the state and certainly um, in advance of the opening of a Region A casino. Um, so that's either, again, either our uh, working through GameSense or us um, providing training to their social workers to be designated agents so that they can uh, provide that enrollment into the, into the program. I think there's great possibility for us to, to con continue this partnership. And uh, um, Commissioners uh, Zuniga and Stebbins um, attended that meeting as well. Director, I think that that's an important point, and, and I would like to be um, kept apprised. I'm sure my fellow commissioners would like to be on the timeline of your work with uh, Secretary Arena because we've heard some important findings, and so the next steps are so critical to implement these findings for. Yeah. strategies to help the vets get the services they need and yeah. deserve so thank you sure really important yeah I agree I agree um, the other study that I, I I'm kind of moving around if you have any questions at all about any of the studies I will do my very best to answer your questions but there were just a few that I, I felt like I wanted to, to spotlight um, the next study that was uh, released back in November was um, it's highlighted on page four of your memo, and it's the casinos and gambling in Massachusetts, African-American perspectives. Mm -hmm. um, African-Americans were identified as a group of specific interest because in our general population survey, they were identified as having a four times greater likelihood of experiencing gambling-related harm than, than other groups. Um, while they, they gambled less, African-Americans gambled less, they're at greater risk of developing gambling-related harm. So we wanted to try to get a better understanding of this. Um, Dr. Vega with JSI and his team wanted to do a, a kind of a broader understanding of, of what's happening. Um, I think it's a complex issue when we, when we, we, yes. Do you mind just clarifying JSI? Uh, it's a, a research uh, group, um, okay. company. Okay, I, I wasn't clear, I didn't know that acronym. Yeah, I didn't, I, I'm sorry. <laughs> I couldn't tell you what JSI stands for. I okay. know that. Um, and so uh, Dr. Vega wanted to do some qualitative research to supplement the quantitative research that was done by the, uh, by the Sigma team. So again, this is kind of this effort to say, we have this, this we're laying this amazing foundation of research through, through Sigma, um, but let's identify perhaps where the gaps are and identify some alternative or creative uh, research methods, including this type of, of qualitative research, to begin to fill in the fill in the gaps. Um, so it did exactly this. Um, it was a relatively small um, study of using 49 participants, so that's certainly something that it's important to understand um, and interpret the uh, any of the findings with with some some caution. But I think that it still pointed out some interesting findings. Um, Dr. Vega did five uh, focus groups um, in uh, Boston, Everett, and Springfield, that covers it, um, where these 49 participants um, were included. So under the findings, participants describe their communities as being impoverished, lacking employment opportunities, and need of social services to address mental health and substance abuse problems. Their primary motivation to gamble included financial need as well as recreational thrill-seeking. Um, participants' trajectory towards problem gambling was described as involving playing lottery games. Um, they reported a host of negative consequences associated with problem gambling, including obviously losing, losing money intended to pay for living essentials such as food and rent, but also losing key elements that help them to gain um, their li livelihood whether it be losing jobs or losing, losing their transportation to get to and from jobs. Um, participants overall were aware that casinos are purposely de designed to entice people to gamble more. The negative aspects associated with the presence of casino relate to 
concerns that already exist within the participants' communities, whether it be crime or drugs, gentrification, um, or dissolution of, of the community ties. The positive new, news views regarding casinos related to what their potential was to create create new jobs and other types of economic um, uh, benefits that would come directly to their communities. So what are the, the, the recommendations from the group? Um, outreach and to educate and treat gambling problems should recognize that many believe that they must gamble out, uh, out of need and, and in order to escape poverty. That if you have limited resources that um, perhaps those re it, to, and they can't cover all of the needed expenses, perhaps your one way out would be to, if you gamble and you would win enough to, to be able to get out, out of poverty. That has, a, I think, a lot of really important implications, both in the treatment realm as well as in the, the prevention realm. We talk a lot of kind of under the umbrella of game sense of gambling within your means, that you have, a, you have money that would be set aside that would be for entertainment, and when that money is gone, that, that that's when you would stop. Um, this, is, this is something that is, I think, an extraordinary finding that where specific messaging um, could be could be uh, designed to to address that address that specifically. Um, many African Americans are, are family and community oriented, and therefore, when we think about um, interventions um, or prevention, again, I think it's recognizing that this is a great strength, um, and that should be that should be leveraged. Can I mention one thing that sure. actually I, I had the benefit of seeing Dr. Vega's um, presentation a couple of times. So I remember um, one of his findings also, which is it, it, sort of captured indirectly here, but uh, uh, not specifically, uh, also had to do with how some of the participants uh, saw the casino as really inviting, diverse, accessible, and welcoming, whereas as an African American, in other, there's other places that are not quite like that. So there was this dichotomy in the, in, in, in the casino, yeah. uh, in addition to what you highlight here. Uh, and I think in addition to what you mentioned relative to game sense, one of the things that we should also um, think about um, and are thinking about um, is um, how the amenities, the, the welcoming can be there, encouraging breaks like we do um, to visit the amenities, not just the slot machines, um, is, is at least another tactic um, to, to deal with, um, with yeah. this topic. Great. Yes, exactly. The, it, any of these reports, the summary that I provide certainly doesn't include the, um, the detail that um, the, the researchers found. So um, after this presentation, um, these reports specifically will then be posted to, to the research page of, of our website. So um, viewers people interested can can read more about about what what was found mm -hmm. so uh, the final piece in order to green bring the greatest benefit residents need to see the added resources and opportunities that casinos are bringing to the community and how they can be accessed um, residents need to be reassured that um, the safety of the community will be guaranteed far beyond the geographical boundaries of, of what the casino is and uh, um, you know, for, for each of these points, I feel like we, we, we have an idea of, uh, we have something that per either is, is in motion or perhaps is within, within reach. And, um, and so this is it's really good information to have for us to have a broader understanding of, of perhaps what, what the needs are. Okay. Um, so that's a highlight of, of reports that were just recent, recently released. There's a few more in there that um, actually I think were presented uh, by the researchers to the commission, so I won't spend time highlighting those. We have a few interesting um, ones that are, that are coming our way. Um, so starting on page five, I have p pending reports and studies. Um, the first that I wanted to, to highlight is um, the follow-up um, analysis of crimes, calls for service, and collision data in communities near MGM Springfield. Um, we had a, uh, a Commissioner Cameron and I had a, a good meeting with our crime analyst, Christopher Bruce, yesterday to get an update on this. It's actually not going to be a three-month report. It's going to be a, a four-month report. 
he uh, was calling us from Springfield where he was gathering, the, finishing up his, his data collection in order to do the analysis. Um, we, uh, we hope to have the, the uh, report in our hand for review by the end of the month so that um, it could be to the commission near the, the end of March, perhaps the March 28th meeting as, as pending right now. Um, so that, that will be interested. That will be a follow-up from the baseline that was presented in um, October. Actually, I have a typo on here, but it was presented in, in October. Um, the next report that I wanted to, to highlight is uh, the Massachusetts Gambling Impact Cohort. Um, this is a, uh, uh, to date, um, there have been uh, four waves of data collection uh, with a cohort of 3,139 adult Massachusetts residents. This, this cohort of, of roughly 3,100 people was drawn from a much broader sample of the general population baseline studies. So the, out of the roughly 10,000, we have 3,100 that we continue to engage with um, uh, through this cohort. There was an oversample so, uh, of problem and at-risk gamblers. So this, even this 3,100 people, um, we have a very rich um, mix of, of individuals that are currently or at risk of experiencing gambling-related harm. Um, the Wave 3 Magic Report is under review by our Research Review Committee, and a finalized report is expected by, um, by the end of the month. That may be a little in, um, ambitious, but certainly um, in March. Um, there are a couple uh, really interesting publications or work that, that is spinning off of this. One is a publication of low-risk gambling guidelines for Massachusetts residents. And another is a publication of a report on the etiological predictors of transitions between waves one and three. So the first, I think um, this publication or a better understanding of low risk gambling and how we can use that information through our Game Sense program and through other, um, other types of prevention programs is really important. Uh, Dr. Volberg has partnered with other other countries, other jurisdictions that are also um, sponsoring uh, gaming cohort studies uh, to try to bring together as much research power as we can to distill down and, and following cohorts over time to better understand what are the, what are the risk factors, what are the protective factors um, that would cause somebody to move from a recreational gambler all, all the way to a um, a gambling disorder or vice versa, individuals that have a gambling disorder, what are the factors, predictive factors that would cause them either to stop gambling altogether or to move down that continuum into recreational gambling. If you take all of that data, you can begin to, to identify themes or in, in other words, gui guidelines or behaviors that would be indicative of low risk, low risk gambling. Um, the GameSense program is fantastic, and I think that we've developed um, a set of tools in, the, in, in our toolbox. And when I think about how do we use our research, how do we use science to, to advance that toolbox, to, to refine it as best as we possibly can, understanding low, establishing these types of low-risk gambling um, guidelines is really important. Uh, the second is the etiological predictors of the transitions. And that, that is much like what I had just described. What, what are the causes that are causing people to move up and down um, the continuum of, of gambling behavior? And you can only get that type of information by doing a longitudinal cohort study. Um, and so the, the efforts of, of this team in order to keep as many people engaged in the study um, is really, really quite impressive. Um, there's a tendency that you see attrition over time and that eventually um, you have such a small N number that you've been able to retain that um, you, it loses the power, it loses the, the ability to, to do, these types, do these types of studies. Um, Dr. Volberg, Dr. Rob Williams, who is the co-principal investigator, um, have done these types of studies before and certainly know some of the tricks to keep people engaged um, in, in a longitudinal study. Um, the next piece that I wanted to highlight is, is very close to being launched, um, and this is after 
more than a couple of years of trying to get it up and off the ground, which is the exportable database or base database of the baseline general population survey and the baseline online panel. Um, I won't go into great detail, but um, to say that we have limited capacity to do the types of analyses that we do with the enormous amount of data that we're collecting. It's incredibly costly to do the analyses that we do. Um, so wouldn't it be great if we could make this data available to other researchers where there, there isn't a lot of data or a lot of data sets like this. So let's make it available to other researchers to do this type of analysis where, quite honestly, we don't have to pay for it, um, but we get the benefit of the analysis and the, and the findings. So um, as we continue down this path with the research program, we have an incredibly valuable data set that is being, that is being developed. We, with some, some parameters around it, want to make that as widely available for research purposes as, as possible. Um, we're working closely with our partners at the Department of Public Health in order to make sure that this database is protected mm -hmm. with all the appropriate um, securities and um, guidelines that um, health information should be protected with. Um, and I'm working with uh, Dr. Tom Land um, to, to build the, the access point and build the, the requirements around data access in Massachusetts. Um, my hope is that we have this available within the next 30, 30 days. Um, an application process will be um, built into to our website um, and probably other, other locations as well. But uh, I hope that we have an application process that can be launched from the MGC website. All right, uh, the final one that I, um, the, well, actually, there's more. <laughs> uh, if you don't mind, um, entertain me just for a few more minutes. Um, I get really excited about this. So. <laughs> um, the, the third uh, research study that we funded under this um, at-risk population uh, research um, is being conducted by the University of Massachusetts Boston Institute for Asian American Studies. They're conducting a pilot study to develop and test methods for recruiting, screening, and conducting diagnostic interviews among Chinese immigrants living and working in Boston's Chinatown. Um, Doctor, um, um, the, the, the study is, is really quite impressive, and um, it's just taken much longer than um, we had anticipated. Dr. Wong, who leads that, um, is fi finishing it up, and we hope to have that, hopefully, for my next update for you within uh, the next couple months. A couple other activities that are that are underway. Um, we provided a, a small uh, grant to the um, Public Health Institute of Western Massachusetts. Um, they are largely responsible for the um, administering the uh, youth health survey as well as the um, um, uh, youth risk behavior survey to um, students in the Springfield Public School District. Um, it's a standardized test, the YRBS, YHS, that is administered to, I think, many, is it 7th, 10th, uh, and 12th graders? I may have that wrong, but it's administered standard um, um, across Massachusetts. The uh, Public Health Institute of Western Massachusetts um, has taken on doing that, it, administering that in partnership with the Springfield Public School District. Um, the, our partnership and the, the funding that we provided allowed us to gather more information about um, youth gambling behavior and um, integrate a uh, youth um, problem gambling screening instrument. I think it's incredibly timely that we, we were able to, to uh, work with this group, with the Springfield Public School as well as the Public Health Institute in order to um, build these questions in questions in, and it would be my hope that we could use this almost as our baseline um, by which we can continue mm -hmm. to track and monitor perhaps how, how um, uh, opening up a casino in Springfield, Massachusetts may or may not be affecting um, youth. Mm. Director Vanderland, and this is the first time we've done anything with high school students, is that correct? Um, that we have, correct. Yes. Yeah. Uh, is it uh, is it prevalent? Any? I mean, are there any good studies out there with uh, with high school students? Yeah, I, I would say that you know the re the research isn't great, 
but what research has been done would again uh, would identify this also as a uh, a group that is at greater risk, not not of g gaining access into casinos, right. um, but of gambling on sports, um, yes. uh, gambling on gil uh, games of skill, gambling yeah. on video games, uh, that that sort of thing. Well, that'll be very interesting. Um, you know, esports. Mm -hmm. um, also, I, I agree. Sports betting is, is of interest, and I'm, I'm I'm hearing. But you know, without a study, you don't know for sure about a lot of uh, issues with uh, online poker with uh, with teenagers, and maybe even more with college students. But so this will be an interesting study. Yeah. I just uh, I think it's great. Yeah. I'm, I'm very excited about the the possibility of, of seeing how how we can. What types of information we can we can gain, and how this this may um, inform prevention services in in the, in the schools. No, agreed. You know, if I can mention um, the the general uh, baseline population survey, um, really um, uh, one of the big findings was, of course, that um, gambling affects different groups differently, and when there was not necessarily a lot of statistically significant information in that study for particular groups. What we did since then, and this is really the three, the three studies that you mentioned, two of which have been completed, and the third one um, with Dr. Wong in, in just about to be completed. Uh, in other words, Asians, African Americans, and veterans. Uh, were identified, uh, were populations that were identified as having a greater risk compared to other populations. Um, and uh, that's the steps we took to, to learn more about them in the qualitative uh, arena. Uh, and that's also the direction in which I see this uh, research agenda expanding. Um, there's the notion that uh, in, in the statute we'll do another look back on the general population survey at um, the before and after and, and we'll, that, that'll come in due time. Um, but um, much of what I think is the excitement that you talk about, Mark, is finding more nuances about how different groups are, are affected differently uh, and develop strategies accordingly. Uh, we cannot really have one strategy for all groups. Right. Exactly. And I'll talk about the, the gaming research strategic plan and, and, um, as well. Excellent. Um, just before I move on to that, however, I just wanted to point out um, we, we, are, uh, we have one final baseline report to build for our public safety um, uh, research. Um, Commissioner Cameron and I again met with, with our crime analyst, Christopher Bruce, uh, yesterday. And we've been in the process for a while of planning our kickoff meeting in Everett and the surrounding communities that is scheduled for February 27th. This kickoff meeting is basically we pull all of the police chiefs and as many of their analysts as we can together um, in uh, the host and surrounding communities for Region A um, and we begin defining what it is that we're, we, we're setting out to do and try to gain as much um, in, input and buy-in and cooperation as we as we can. Um, it's worked phenomenally well so far in Plainville and Springfield, and we have no reason to believe that that isn't going to be successful um, this time, too. Uh, yeah, for the benefit of our new chair, um, this is an area, how does, what does the casino uh, enter into whatever community, how does that affect crime? And this is something that with very little research in this area, partly because uh, getting police agencies to participate in sharing their data is difficult. They protect their data because it could be used in ways that they would not be comfortable with. So we, um, we, we started this and we just went out and asked for their help and said, please help us. We have this piece to do, but we need your help. We didn't say we want you to do X, Y, and Z. We said, can you help us? And a brainstorming session came about, and one of the chiefs recommended our crime analyst that we've been using now for years. He's worked out, ter he's terrific. He's very well um, uh, respected throughout the world, actually. Um, and um, he's really dug into this project. And um, so once again, we were, will the chiefs in the Boston area participate and, you know, 
pleasantly surprised, as always, that after sending a letter, they are all participating. They will all be at the meeting. And um, again, we will ask for their help. And, and it is a sharing of data and an, an analysis that we go through. But it's really important, especially now with, uh, with Springfield and now with Everett coming online. And one of the things I love about this project is it's real-time information. So if there is an issue, a strategy can be put in place. It's not just research-driven. It is uh, real-time data analysis and police chiefs putting their heads together saying, hey, this is what Response. we see, and let's try this strategy to, to, to in fact, try to combat whatever the issue may be. So um, yeah, it's an interesting project, and we continue to be um, pleased with the participation here in the Commonwealth. I've spoken about this project at many conferences, and people have said to me, how the heck did you get the chiefs to participate? And I said, we asked them nicely, and we, we value their input. They know more about their communities than we do, so we didn't, uh, and it just, it just worked for us. So Mark, you're, you're right about that. It really has been um, something that uh, we're pleased at the participation, and once again, all of the chiefs here about 10 of them, right? They're all, they'll all be part of our meeting at the end of the month. Yeah. It's great to have you um, help lead that. I, <laughs> you, you have the credibility of, uh, to, to bring everybody together and, and gain their buy-in. So. Well, thank you for that. <laughs> um, finally, I just wanted to cover two, two initiatives that are, that are underway um, right now. Um, as Commissioner Zuniga mentioned, we're, we're going through a, a gaming research strategic planning process. Um, uh, Chair Judd Stein, you, you haven't been involved with this, but um, for the other four commissioners, um, I, I'm working with uh, Judith Glynn. She is the principal um, at a group called Strategic Science. Um, so uh, Judith and I have met with um, the four commissioners to to try to get a better understanding of what their their needs are out of a research agenda. Um, more broadly, we partner with uh, very closely with um, EOHHS and DPH. Um, so the, to the extent possible, we um, we also made sure that we interviewed as wide and far as we could to get a better understanding of what um, how this research agenda can can help those. Um, agencies uh, and inform their programs as possible. Um, I've worked with uh, Commissioner Stebbins to uh, do some targeted outreach to stakeholders um, on the ground in Springfield, um, specifically in the, that are, have an interest in some of the economic research that, that we're doing. Um, it's, it's not by any means an exhaustive list of, of people that we could do, but I think that it has, has certainly opened our eyes as to what we're doing well um, and how we can do a better better job down the line. Um, I've, I've described it's the, the statute calls for a research agenda. Um, and so that's how I've described it for most of the, for the five, almost six years that I've been here. But I think it's time to start calling it a research program mm -hmm. where you, you see each, each research deliverable, each product that comes out of the, the research agenda um, as cohesive and somehow informs the other pieces of it. So I'm calling it a research program. Um, now it's to, to kind of symbolize that, that we really, we, we have an enormous um, gift to be able to do this type of research. Let's make sure that we use it to the maximum extent possible. Mm -hmm. So what's kind of bubbling up, there's, there's a couple things that have really bubbled up through the strategic planning process. And let me say it's not done yet, but where I think I see this going. Um, one is that we, we want to, to maximize our ability to, to collect data and have it used by other researchers. So um, developing a really sophisticated, um, very um, accessible database for, for other researchers. And it includes the, the research, the data sets that we have that we, to the extent possible that we can share those. Um, but it will also include player card data that's a requirement of the, the, uh, the statute under Section 97. So all player card data needs to be um, made accessible for research purposes as well. So that will be included. We, um, we wanted to do a better job of, of research translation. So 
um, there's a, a how do you how do you take the research that we have and translate it into concrete policy and practice recommendations as quickly as possible, as opposed to the ten years or so that it traditionally takes for research to be translated into something concrete. We want to streamline that as quickly as possible, and I think that there's there's almost a new field of research um, translation out there. Um, I've, I've uh, had some conversations with individuals that this is what they do. This is their focus. So let's, let's, let's. Um, I think that the uh, research strategic plan will recommend that that we invest in doing some of this translation work as as well. Um, and then finally, and it and it goes right along with my next, um, the final thing that I wanted to mention is community engaged research. Um, community based participatory research is a specific type of research that that says we're. We, we don't necessarily know what all of the right research questions are, but the community does know what those research questions are. They do know what the, what the issues are. And so we're doing a great job of, of trying to get a picture of what's happening at, at, a, at a specific level across the state with the introduction of casinos. But we have, as I said <laughs> repeatedly this morning, we have some gaps in there. And we have, um, a lot of people that are probably saying that this research isn't speaking to me. It's not doing me any good. And community-engaged research, community-based participatory research is uh, intended to address that specifically. Um, it, is, it requires that there's community participation. It requires that there's a community process in order to develop, um, to define what the issue is, to define the question, and to develop a, a research plan um, to, to answer the question. Um, and that then the findings of that research are used to inform um, policy and practice and with, within the community and to empower the community to make their, those, those types of decisions. Um, we want it. We want the same high level of research that we have across the board. So there is a requirement that, that even with this type of research that there is, there is engagement with, um, with researchers. There's also a specific push to Though not uh, a hard requirement, there's a push and high recommendation that that it complements the the existing research that we have underway, um, and that it complements um, initiatives, um, prevention and intervention initiatives um, surrounding problem gambling that are being launched now by the Department of Public Health. So, um, this I see as a, a specific arm of the research agenda that would I would like to see, and I hope that. Um, people agree that would be an enduring part of this research program. So, uh, yeah, this is. The, let me just emphasize: uh, this is a very important next phase of the research uh, agenda, and I think it's very apt that you call it the research program. Um, some of the things, um, the strategic planning that we had conducted, um, that we are conducting, uh, has taken a little bit more. A little bit longer than we anticipated, but it was necessary. And the principles emerging out of that, as you mentioned, are uh, also very uh, important for us to begin to um, to think about. And we had been thinking about uh, at least a couple: the data storage, for example, uh, as well as the knowledge translation, for a while, out of necessity. Uh, one of the um, uh, the ironies about how much research uh, we're producing is that I felt at times that the next study comes in and drowns a little bit the prior one, and the insight, um, you know, and the policy uh, uh, um, next step, if you will, uh, sometimes can get a little a little lost. Yeah. Not in this commission, not with this staff, but with with some of the stakeholders that are critical mm -hmm. to the process uh, out of, out of um, outside of these walls. So. Um, a real emphasis on, on this knowledge translation, I think, is going to be um, very important as we continue this, uh, this program. Yeah. Um, and uh, as well, the, the community engagement uh, is almost like the third leg in that stool, the data sharing, the knowledge translation, and the, mm -hmm. and the community engagement to further essentially the same, the same uh, goals. Make sure that the right research gets to the right people, and right. Uh, in a timely in a timely way. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, Mark, great update. Just just a couple of notes, especially as we look at what you're 
the deliverables you've added in FY19, and we've talked about how some of this research can have some overlay into John Ziemba's work, potentially into Jill's work. You know, great example is looking at the first wave of the MGM Springfield Patron Survey and using that with local entities on the ground, like a Convention and Visitors Bureau, to better understand why people are coming to, I mean, they're coming to Springfield to go to MGM, but where are they being drawn from? Yeah, thanks um, for pointing that one out. That's um, ready to launch at the end of, um, I think next week, we will have our first wave of data collection at MGM. Okay. Um, with the, the, the uh, Sigma group, so. Uh, okay. Sort of really let's let's piece. think about those groups that would really like to do a deep dive into the data. The other one um, I'm looking for is obviously the MGM new MGM employee data yes. um, survey. I know you got you and uh, Teresa have been hard at work on that. It was a little bit of a different scenario that we were operating under mm -hmm. uh, as a, uh, compared to the PPC survey. But uh, uh, when we get a timeline for that, you know that'd be great information okay. to have as well. Thank you. Great work, Mark. Thank you. Any other questions? All set. Thank you very much. Move on to item eight. Uh, Commissioner Stebbins, we understand that you would like to present uh, an item for the Commission's consideration. Sure. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, colleagues, as you'll see in uh, our packet this week, um, there's an attached memo. We've been asked to sign a letter of support for MGM Springfield's application in the Mass Historical Commission for recognition of their historic adaptive reuse efforts during their development. Um, you know, throughout the RFA2 process and the construction period, um, this commission has always taken the opportunity to offer our vocal support and plaudits for MGM's efforts. Uh, we've all understood the unique and open nature of the project. However, integrating renovated historic buildings, preservation of key architectural uh, pieces, I believe has made this a, uh, truly a unique integrated casino resort among its peer properties. I also believe the involvement of the community and the support of MGM CEO helped create this one-of-a-kind facility. Um, I recognize as regulators, we always need to maintain our responsibility point out where a licensee uh, needs to take steps to remain in compliance with the law. Um, but I, I believe we can also take a moment to highlight their successes. Uh, we were involved with MGM Springfield's nomination to Mass Econ last year as an economic development impact project. Uh, again, highlighting their project as the largest privately developed construction project in the history of the region. Um, I also think recognizing their success can be rooted in the overall benefit gaming has to the Commonwealth. Um, I certainly welcome any edits or comments you might have in the draft language of the letter, but I'm hopeful we can approve <coughs> the letter and allow all of us to sign it and provide it to MGM for inclusion in their nomination packet. Is there a motion? Well, first, Commissioner Stebbins, I think. Um, well, I, I would agree that this is a, a good area for us to be involved. Um, those of us who have watched this since the beginning, they have made tremendous efforts to um, to really listen to the community and, and try to abide by um, making that. They, they assimilated to the neighborhood. They really right. did. Um, so many people have commented on that. Um, watching them move that church was amazing, mm -hmm. right? And, and that, the look of that, um, up there as part of that project, I think is really um, very interesting. I, I, I note that a group of legislators were out last week for the first time and were so uh, positively, uh, their comments were all very positive about uh, the improvement to the neighborhood because of the casino, and I just know that's not the case everywhere around the country. Um, so I, I agree that this is a good area for us to uh, provide support, and uh, I move that we, uh, we do endorse this uh, letter today. Can I mention something, uh, you know, in addition to um, just to, for your comments, and I will be, of course, um, very um, enthusiastically supporting this. Um, I think um, an important part of this is that the process really worked. The Springfield Historical um, Commission 
uh, at a first uh, level. And, 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 and again, we, I, as I look back to, to all those um, meetings that we had out there that yeah. were informed about that process, um, the, and then the, the Mass Historical Commission, uh, there was a lot of back and forth between uh, you know, those two groups, other stakeholders, and of course MGM. Um, they did not get everything that they wanted initially, but they did recognize that um, this project was very important for the overall, and they were very much in favor of the project altogether because it was going to do itself a lot of historical preservation let alone all the economic development that they were also uh, very much in favor. Uh, but there had to be a, a number of uh, judgment calls and, and a little bit of a back and forth um, for all of that uh, purpose, ultimately, of, of, of historical preservation. I myself was a, cup, a little skeptical about some of the things that remained and uh, in, in the preservation. Uh, of course, everybody recognized the armory and the church. Um, um, but then now, seeing, or you know, a few months ago, seeing the final product, um, I, I think it was uh, tremendous. I think, uh, again, the, the, the process, uh, which is a message that I think is the main message to be delivered to Secretary Galvin here in the letter, is that it, it really worked. It wasn't without uh, the back and forth that I'm describing but it was uh, well uh, done by all the parties. And, and, and in that context, mm -hmm. I think it's good that it comes from us uh, mm -hmm. with, that, with that message. Well, you, you raise a great point. Um, the cooperation and the, and the partnership with the, the folks on the ground in the city of Springfield and the Springfield Historic Commission, you know, I think back to one of the incidents, the you know, conversation around the Chandler Hotel. Yes. A couple of presidents stayed overnight there, you know, yes. the historical significance. Um, but in, in a lot of local advocates were fighting for protection of that building. And it wasn't until MGM and the local advocates had a chance to actually physically go through the building that they all realized that the building was somewhat beyond saving in its current state. So, you know, to your point, it was, uh, it was probably not the easiest path to get to where they wanted to be, but the fact that uh, all parties, including our licensees, were willing to listen and willing to kind of fashion through some uh, some compromises. I think is what really has made mm -hmm. you know project successful. Yep. And and I remember at, at the time, a lot of these you know has a translation in additional cost, additional timeline, mm -hmm. um, which you know it's just the way it is around here. Uh, you know. The uh, licensees would say, "Well, it's a lot more expensive to build than it's in uh, Nevada, of course, but but then the result is also um, really good to observe and appreciate." Mm -hmm. So we have a motion uh, to approve this letter of support. Do we have a second? I second that. Any further discussion? Okay. Those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Hearing none. Five zero. Great. Great. Thank you for your leadership, uh, Commissioner Stebbins. Yeah, well Thank done, you. sir. For your support. Do we have any other business to discuss? I, I have just one other Commissioner update. update. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Commissioner Cameron, along with uh, Directors Driscoll and Griffin and Crystal Howard, had a chance to sit down with our stakeholders on the Build a Life campaign and kind of review our progress. Um, I think we realize, and it was reinforced, the program continues to assist with recruiting women to the construction trade, and interest always spikes when our campaign visibility is up, so we had some good conversation <coughs> around funding the campaign as we look ahead. Um, interestingly enough, yesterday, our partners at the Policy Group on Tradeswomen Issues showed us that in 2018, over 600 women enlisted in apprentice programs across the Commonwealth. Um, this is a 25% increase from 2017, mm -hmm. and look back in the data, 2012, the number was 173 in one year. So they've had, you know, we congratulate our partners on their success. Mm -hmm. um, a question was raised at the meeting about whether the Gaming Commission could require licensees to hire a certain percentage of women from their construction project into some of the key ongoing facility positions. Um, 
I'm not sure we saw that there, we had the authority to do that at this point. However, I think it's a, a su suggestion our licensees should consider in their overall effort to achieve their goals for hiring minority women and veterans as part of their operational team. So it was a great meeting. Yeah, I agree. Uh, those efforts are tremendous. I think we have to give credit to uh, uh, Director um, um, Driscoll on that as well because of, I mean, that's really a professionally done uh, campaign. Mm -hmm. And I think the numbers are a direct result of, of the campaign itself. It's really those, those billboards, those signs are really effective. In fact, I, I stop and look every time I see one. Uh, there's one right next door, right, at this new project. So I know how hard um, directors uh, Griffin and Driscoll worked on that campaign, and um, I did not know it was a 25 percent increase. That's a tremendous number. That's huge. Tremendous well, number. Remind us, what is the goal that they speak about uh, by 2020? Their, their goal is to have 20 percent of the construction workforce in Massachusetts be women by 2020. By 2020. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think we all uh, understood early on that was a very aggressive goal, but I, I'm impressed with some of the statistics they shared yesterday that show that there's a tremendous upswing and, and women are really giving full consideration to a career in the trades is something that provides great benefits, great pay, and some yeah. great opportunities. Yeah. To hear some of those women who work three jobs previously, maybe in retail or some other position now uh, with one good paying job with benefits, supporting families, it's really, it's, it's yeah, inspirational. Uh, I have one more commissioner, up, uh, commissioner update, which is just, you know, um, this was brought up speaking about gaps in research. Um, when we were updating over with our partners, partners at the uh, Department of Health, yep. um, a mention to us w would be, is there any way that you can look at trafficking in, in and around a casino. And um, human trafficking. Mm -hmm. Human trafficking, yeah. yes. And you know, I still make a distinction because I really do believe there is a distinction between prostitution and trafficking. Uh, but we are putting a meeting together with, um, there's some real experts here in the Commonwealth uh, that oversee um, uh, human trafficking. So we are putting a meeting together with a representative from the Department of Health and these folks from law enforcement and uh, with Christopher Bruce, our crime analyst, <coughs> to see if there's something, a way to capture data, maybe a way to do some training with our, um, with our unit members. Um, you know, I'm thinking, of course, Springfield and then Everett, um, uh, to, to make sure that they're observing everything they can about what's happening in the operations. We don't want to presume or, um, say that there is anything going on now because we don't know. But I do think it was an interesting observation and uh, look forward to putting this meet, pulling this group together to really brainstorm. Um, is there a way to, for us to, um, again, train our people so that they, they are aware of um, telltale signs? And secondly, um, capture data if there, if there is data to be captured. So. Um, that's, we'll, we'll have that meeting uh, later this month as well. That's great. I would be remiss not to note that the Governor's Commission on Domestic Violence and Sexual Assault does address human trafficking issues. The Lieutenant Governor is chair, and given okay. my most recent job, I'd be remiss not to direct you for resources there. Okay, great. Thank you for that. Okay. I do have one update, and it's sort of out of order. I apologize. Um, but I think it's appropriate this time. Uh, yesterday, Mike Sangalang, our digital communications coordinator, walked into my office with an envelope. And he also cornered me, so I couldn't run out of the, envelope, the office before with an envelope. accepting the envelope. Uh, Mike is moving on. Oh. He has a new uh, 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 position. Um, and uh, Director Driscoll and I just wanted to recognize, you know, his work with digital coordination communications with all our folks, all our different um, uh, directors and staff. Mike was really a utility player, and one of the jobs he did very well, obviously, was streaming these meetings. You know, um, I think the commission has become one of the leaders in streaming, and that's in in big part to Mike's efforts both here and then when we go out remotely in the field. Um, <clears throat> the, I, I'd like to think our streaming quality is among the highest. 
um, but that's due to Mike's efforts making sure the microphones work, the cameras are on the right people, um, you know, we do, we're ADA compliant and all those things. So I think, unfortunately, Mike, is this the last meeting you will be? Yep, wow. and he's oh, giving wow. us the nod. Wow. So um, I just, we, we want to recognize his work and uh, say thank you and obviously best wishes. Wow. Yes, thank Tremendous. you, Michael. Thank you, Mike. Thank you very much. You will be missed. Mm. I think he also made us look good. <laughs> Not well, just dream. For, you can't, for some of you, you know, that, that's can't impossible. For some of us, that's a I just hard. never look. <laughs> and, and Mike, you can flip the camera one more time at you. <laughs> Please. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for your Thanks service. very much. Thank you, Mike. I always get nervous when someone says they handed me an envelope. <laughs> that was a Is there any other business for the commission? Okay. Item 10 is uh, notice for an executive session. The commission will now go into executive session pursuant to Massachusetts General Laws, Chapter 30A, Section 21A3, for the purpose of discussing litigation strategy in the case of Stephen A. Wynn versus Karen Wells, the Massachusetts Gaming Commission, Wynn Resorts, et al. Given the posture of the case, it is clear that a discussion of the commission's strategy in an open meeting public, an open public meeting would have a detrimental effect on the litigation portion of the commission. The commission will reconvene in open session at the end of the executive session. Do I have a motion to go into executive session? So moved. Second. Okay. We'll have a roll call vote of the commission to go into executive session. I presume there's no further discussion. Okay. Commissioner Stebbins. Aye. Commissioner Zuniga. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Cameron. Aye. And the chair votes yes. Thank you. The commission is now in executive session. All members of the public and any staff members not involved in the matter to be discussed must leave the room. I'd ask that all live audio and video recording and the live streaming be shut off and the doors to the room be closed. Thank you, Mike. The Commission received a briefing today on litigation strategy in the executive session. In compliance with the open meeting law, which requires that any vote to be taken be listed on the meeting agenda, a vote was listed on the exec for the executive session. The vote was put on the agenda in the event that the Commission needed to take some action based upon the briefing. The Commission decided not to take any action at this time, so no vote is needed and no vote will be taken. Do I have a motion to close the executive session and reconvene? Oh, in open session, we did that. So sorry. Um, do I have a, um, a, a motion to close this executive session, this open session? My, my apologies. So moved. Second. Um, and do I need a roll call for this? No. So all those in favor of a motion to adjourn? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Five. Five eyes. Thank you. Thank you.